Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. You are watching the Paris Fintech Forum Communities video interview series. I'm Elliot Gotkin, and today I'm joined by the founder and CEO of Briga, Ben Morel. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, okay, so before we get cracking, uh, let's learn a little bit more about Briga. Okay, so Ben, tell us about Briga. <laughs> Well, look, Briga was co-founded by myself and two other entrepreneurs back in 2015 when we closed our first fund. And the whole idea was very much to bring more to the ecosystem and build the kind of VC we would have loved to have when we were on the other side of the table. So, uh, you know, our experiences, you know, were to launch half a dozen businesses, sold the majority of them. One got exited for eight billion dollars. So obviously, you know, we had some tips to share, um, and and but it wasn't easy. Like it was, it was hard to fundraise. And you know, if I knew how hard it was to raise the first fund, maybe I would have uh, gone into being an entrepreneur again. But you know, all in all, the whole you know idea behind Briga was to say, okay, let's be the founders' first fund. Uh, let's try to impact as many industries as we can because you know, together as a team, we could have changed maybe one industry if we got lucky. I think the idea with Briga was to be able to change a hundred of them. So that's 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 the one thing that sort of really drives us. Um, and then do things differently. So as I said, I mean, everyone at Briga is a, is a founder in the investment team. And to us, it's super important to make sure that we have that strong entrepreneurial DNA. Uh, but also we were one of the very first uh, VCs in Europe to build a strong scaling team to sort of support and guide our founders once we've invested in them to have them grow and execute on the plan. And so that's now... 10 people already you know, on the on, on the payroll and helping us and our founders grow. Uh, last year, it was 120 recruitments for our portfolio companies. And this is just growing, right? So we had a we had a hell of a journey so far and uh, and, and quite excited. Right. And on top of that, uh, with your recent uh, closing of your recent venture fund, uh, I think you pretty much doubled your assets under management now over 500 million euros. Um, pretty good time to have uh, lots of uh, dry powder in the bank, I imagine, with valuations plummeting. Yeah, well, look, you know, it's, it's always good to be cashed up, to be fair. So, um, yes, we, as I said, you know, we, we grew quite fast and, you know, from zero seven years ago to already half a billion under management now. Uh, with offices in, in Paris, London, Barcelona. So we really have the capacity to invest at every stage. We go from pre-seed to series A uh, to start with and then capacity to double down. And yeah, it's true that you know this new venture fund allows us to do uh, and lead proper series A across all the different you know uh, markets we know. Um, and as you said, I mean, it's, it's the best time for a fund to, to be cashed up and be able to support more founders. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of companies um, may need and require some extra cash in, in the few months, in the next few months. So it's, it's good to have the capacity to be at their side and, and be able to be a partner on the longer run. Do you have any specific targets in mind? I know you're not going to tell me the companies, but I mean, perhaps the particular segments that, that maybe your top three uh, segments that you're going to be targeting with uh, some of these new funds? Well, look, overall, I think, you know, we have a we have a, a fairly open mandate and, 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 and investment thesis. I think, you know, we're probably one of these funds who care more about people and um, ambition and, and drive rather than verticals per se. But it's true that, you know, some of the industries that are still lagging behind in terms of uh, digital revolution are still to be taken. So, you know, given the fact that we have a strong foothold in the UK, we, we, we do a lot of uh, fintech, intratech there, obviously. Uh, so it's quite exciting to see what's going on, especially on the B2B side, what, what the impact of, you know, uh, Web3 and all these technologies. And, and, and that's one big element, obviously. Um, and then the other one is the future of society. I think, you know, no one cannot testimony on what happened, you know, over the last two years. And obviously, you know, with the change in, in, in the way we work, with the change in the way we interact with people. I mean, you know, a few years back, this would have happened in a studio. Now we do this live online and it's, it's, it's kind of cool to, uh, to be participating into that revolution. So the future of society of how we consume, how we work, how we live, how we, uh, how we uh, get cured and, you know, is, is, is fascinating. Okay, so look, uh, we've heard about Briga. Let's now uh, learn a little bit more about Ben. So Ben, you founded Briga, I think, almost 10 years ago. Uh, what made you want to make the switch from founding startups 
to investing in them. I think you said that perhaps if you'd known what you knew now, then maybe you'd have stuck with entrepreneurship. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, I, I, yes, I think, you know, I, I got the uh, entrepreneurial bug a, a while ago. And um, I think personally, I, I don't quite see the difference, to be fair. I think, you know, I, I, we very much, you know, um, manage and grow Briga as a, as a startup, as a company anyway. So, I mean, the fact that we grew so fast, so quickly, uh, you know, and, and, and so big, relatively speaking, to the ecosystem in a few years, the fact that we opened offices with all the challenges of working with different cultures and different people, uh, the, the, the questions you have around, you know, what's the future of VC, where should I go, to, you know, what other geography should I open, what stage should I focus on? Um, I mean, all of this to me doesn't make a massive difference. So I know a lot of people ask me the question, oh, wow, you know, is it pretty hard to be on the other side of the table? And to be fair, once you've learned a few, a few tricks, I mean, it's, it's, to me at least, it's the same, same gig. It's like, you know, building a company, trying to be the best at what we do, uh, trying to never take anything for granted. And look, you know, it's a long life. Uh, I'll probably be an entrepreneur uh, on the other side of the table again, but, but an entrepreneur anyhow. Right. And I mean, as you say, you, you, you cover lots of different segments, like there's no specific segment that you're, you're targeting, but you founded fintechs in the past and even founded, a, I think, a, a rugby wear brand. Uh, the, the same kind of, is that the same kind of concept in that, like, if you're a good entrepreneur and, you know, you know how to manage a company and build a company that it doesn't matter whether it's financial services or, uh, you know, rugby shirts? Look, it's a, it, it's a good question. I think, you know, you... Um... You, you learn you learn a lot along the years and and you know there are things that change i mean for instance you know when i launched rugby division so that rugby clothing brand you're mentioning back in the day i mean you know instagram didn't exist so i mean if, if i were to launch a a t2c brand today obviously the world would be different so everything is always changing that's why you know repeat founders sometimes make mistake and there are companies they launched that didn't work or that don't work just because that's that's the game right you never are totally uh you know um you don't you don't you don't master everything all the time and the world is evolving around you and things are changing um but but yes i, I think that you know if you have a, a few good principles so you know always shoot for the stars and and at worst case scenario you end up on the moon uh, always you know higher better than you uh, always you know try to learn and 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 test and and reassess and 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 do it again and again and again I think all these all these principles can apply to anything, uh, and you can do this in pretty much any industry, right? As long as you get the the principles right, and you wanna and and you're committed to it, because that's that's what it is. Like that's what it takes. I think you know, um, I, I didn't expect this when we raised our first fund, but you know, we met with 500 people to to get there, and and you know that was a, a hell of a fundraise. Uh, so if you have the commitment and 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 you know you pay you pay your duty and you do your exercise, I think. Yes, once you're an entrepreneur and you make it work, you can make it work in different industries. So I'm pretty sure I'll probably tackle another one after after Briga. No pun intended with the with the word tackle there. And if and can you tell me the you know perhaps your best and worst day um, as an entrepreneur? Ooh, oh, best and worst day. That's a good one. Uh, best day. Ah, oh, interesting. I think my best days, I mean, I don't know, I don't know if I have one particular one. I think my best days overall is, you know, when I hire someone and I put faith and, and, and work into sort of try to, to teach them what I know, which is not much, but, you know, at least what I gathered along the years and I see them grow as, as people and as professionals. And, you know, that, that's, that's to me the, the best thing, right? So every time, you know, have someone I recruited, you know, years ago and now coming part of the, you know, the x Comet Briga or, you know, x Comet other companies I founded, you're like, oh, wow, that was that was a bet. And, you know, you can see people develop into your company and uh, and you're part of this somehow. Right. So that's that's probably the most. Um, yeah, that's to me, that's what, you know, gives me the, the, the sort of more, 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 uh, more uh, happiness, I would say. And then the worst ones. Well, I would say it's it's also people, to be fair, like it's, it's very much people linked. So, you know, when you make mistake on people and, you know, you think you got the right set up and you put your trust and all your effort into someone and, and that someone doesn't really give you back what they should, that, that's that's probably where, where it hurts the most. The rest, 
you know, I mean, you're an entrepreneur, there's highs, there's lows, clients, you know, suppliers, funding, and that's part of the game, right? So that, that always happens. But I think the one thing that I really get the most excited about and the most disappointed about is, is, is people both ways. Okay. So Ben, look, a key part of this interview is to get your take on the future of finance. But first, we are going to take a very quick break, after which we're going to continue our conversation with Briga founder and CEO, Ben Morell. Welcome back. And don't forget, if you're not already a full member of our community, everything you need to join can be found at www.parisfintechforum.com. And now, Ben, let's talk about the future of finance. So, uh, Ben, you know, you're, you're an investor, so you're kind of in the thick of things right now. What do you make of the fundraising environment right now and how rapidly it changed. Did it come as a shock? Look, not really. I wouldn't say as a shock. Like, you know, everyone has been expecting some correction for the last years. And, and you know, everyone thought that, you know, probably the first lockdown back in March 2020 was it. Um, governments poured, you know, poured so much money into the economy and, you know, so much support that ultimately it didn't feel like one. Uh, but that was just, you know, pushing it a few years back. So, I mean, I wasn't surprised that the war, I actually thought back in 2020, just before lockdown, I don't know if you guys remember, but there was a massive incident between, you know, the, uh, uh, I think, Iranian general that got, you know, bombed by the Americans or something like, it could have been a war back then, right? And and somehow we could have, avo- we avoided it. And, and, and now it's, it's back again between, you know, Ukraine and Russia. So everything, you know, um, is, is, when there's so much money, like, you know, governments have been pouring money into the economy and, and central banks since the 2008. So, I mean, all, all of a sudden you need to rationalize prices. Um, so that's 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 a normal situation. Um, so not really surprised. Um, the one thing I don't know yet is, you know, where's the uh, the bottom of it, right? Because I don't think we have touched the bottom yet because, um, you know, we see that, you know, supply chains are suffering, that inflation is still running. Um, so... Uh, you know, who can tell? No one has a crystal ball, but I, I guess if we knew where the bottom was, we'd be we'd be out there kind of buying everything. We uh, filling our boots, as we say. Um, but as you say, you know, investors can't control for bottlenecks uh, in supply chains or for rising inflation or for rising interest rates or Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but do you think things kind of got out of hand? W- would you I mean, would, would you say, ah, oh, this is because of these guys and those guys who are just throwing money at everything at ridiculous valuations? Uh, do you think that they kind of you know, maybe take some of the blame for um, the turmoil that we're seeing on public and private markets right now? Well, probably, right? I think, yes, there, there, were, there were some irrational behaviors and, and, and that doesn't help. Like, it doesn't help the ecosystem as a whole and, and you know, it drives valuations up and, you know, we, we, all, we all heard people saying, oh, you know, I don't care paying a high price at Series A because I'm going to cash out a Series C. And, I mean, that kind of behavior where people don't really care about you know building companies or or solutions or or disrupting markets anymore they just think of you know speculation so when you are in a speculation bubble uh yeah it's not ideal and 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 there are there are some some problems with it so hopefully this sort of you know settles down a little bit and people are more rational and and you know keep the same level of 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 craziness somehow because you know when you invest early stage in companies that want to change the world and they have three guys in a in a in a in a garage you're like well you have to be crazy somehow but you know craziness doesn't have to come with speculation right so there's a bit of a of a balance to be to be found there which bits of fintech do you think are most vulnerable well i 
would say financing overall, right? I think, you know, financing is going to be tough. Uh, rates are going to change heavily. Um, so all the financing tech are probably the ones that are going to suffer the most first. Um, except maybe for the ones that try to find other ways of, of, of financing. So, you know, uh, different debt products, uh, different scoring, uh, you know, rationalizing debt again. Um, maybe there's a way, but, but, but probably first and foremost, yeah, uh, lending and financing overall is going to be is going to be tough. But, all, you know, once again, it's a question of timing, right? So it, it may be tough on the short run. On the longer run, it creates opportunities, right? Because so when, when you when you look at what happened in the 2008, yes, there was a big, you know, financing crush first, and it was really tough for all of these guys. And then that created opportunities because, you know, it created a, a financing crush in, in, into the banking industry as well. And the banks aren't as agile, agile as, as startups. So by the time they go back into funding, they probably leave some space for uh, for startups to emerge and, and finance the real economy. So I, th- I suppose it's fair to say that the, the days of growth at all costs is perhaps out of fashion and, and will be for some time. Yes, um, look, you know, I, I'm not even sure it was it was a fashion, to be fair. It's like, you know, a few people really pushed for it. Um, uh, but that was more of a, of a, a financial financial arbitrage because you're like well you know if, if it's free money basically when rates are zero uh, then when you have free money you should spend it as much as you can right so that that's kind of creates a bit of a of a misaligned behavior around you know growing for the sake of valuation versus growing for the sake of, of building a sustainable business ultimately right and being founder myself you know I know that at the beginning you know you're you're losing money and and, and yes it doesn't look like it's sustainable as of now but as long as you're building for the future uh, and not just, you know, building your valuation up, but your company up, then, then it's, a, it's a different story. And of course, we saw a lot of companies during the, the boom as we, as we had it going public at a reasonably early stage via special purpose acquisition companies or, or, or SPACs. Were you always of the view that, you know, this is going to end in tears, that this is just way too speculative and, and perhaps these companies shouldn't be going public right now? And what, what was your take on, on the, the SPAC phenomenon? Well, the SPAC phenomenon is, is an interesting one as well. I think they, they, it's, um, it's a good tool, in theory, it's a good tool to fund companies that require patient capital because, you know, you can probably have enough money on your book at the beginning, if you're wise, to use it on the longer run. And so the, the theory of it makes sense for sort of, you know, hardware, bio, like all the sort of very engineering research heavy companies, right? Um, if you're reasonable about, A, the, the value of the tech, so there's a real moat into the, the technology of it, and B, if you're reasonable about how do you fund your business and, you know, don't just spend your 100 or 200 million from the get-go, but just, you know, spend it wisely across a few years obviously like anything um you know that solution uh, got applied to other businesses that weren't exactly in this situation a businesses that hadn't hadn't proved a real moat in terms of tech or or not enough probably and and b businesses that just you know burn it all so you know if you burn it all very quickly you don't have a moat then you know the financial market is just correct you're like oh well you know this thing doesn't make sense anymore uh, so just dump the price and then, you know, the SPAC's got very bad press. So it's like, you know, VC's got very bad press in the 2000s, right? Because, you know, a bunch of people just invested in, 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 in crap businesses, right? So I think it's a good thing that it rationalizes a little bit uh, once again and that it gives people um, a notion of, you know, balance, like, like anything, right? I mean, you know, you, you, you can apply this to your own life and your own uh, day-to-day um, behavior. Balance is balance is good. <laughs> and Ben, you're, you're based in London, if I'm not mistaken, but Briga is headquartered in Paris. Um, are they now on a par in terms of their strengths in attracting and retaining startups and, and fintechs in particular? Well, look, I, I mean, we've always had a very strong international perspective at Briga, and you know, we now have London, Paris, Barcelona. We're looking at other locations as well because we know, especially early stage where we invest, that it's a local business and you need to build that relationship, these relationships and know people. And although, you know, we can do things on- online, it's always better to go for a, a lunch, dinner or drinks and, and build, you know, strong ties uh, with people you're going to be partnering with for years. Um, 
I think London has always been ahead of the rest of Europe, given, I mean, given the strong links, you know, it always had entertained with the US. And, you know, when you go to, to London um, and for the first time and enter the, uh, the tech ecosystem, you realize how many American people there are around the table, which you don't see as much in the rest of Europe, right? So that kind of infusion from, from experience, you know, US experience and US knowledge and US network kind of helped the, the London ecosystem at first plus the combination of having real access to capital because, you know, London is a big financial financial place. Um, obviously, this is changing a bit. I think, you know, A, with Brexit, unfortunately, um, you know, financial the financial London market isn't as, as excited as it used to be. Um, and B, you know, the, uh, the other ecosystems are catching up. So, I mean, you know, Berlin, Paris, Stockholm, Barcelona, all these guys are pushing hard and, and now everyone realizes that, you know, there's potential to be building amazing companies from pretty much everywhere in the world as long as you have the markets and, you know, the, the UK market isn't, as, is, isn't bigger than the German or the French one. So the only advantage was the connection to the US. So once we bridge the gap between these, you know, continental European ecosystems in the US and or China and or India and or Brazil and or tomorrow Nigeria, well, then, you know, we can build amazing companies from here. Okay. All right, Ben. So look, uh, it's time now for our, our rapid fire round of questions. Uh, are you ready? Ready. Ready to go. Okay. So we've got 90 seconds. I'm going to start my timer and we're going to try and get through as many of these as possible. Just one word answers uh, would be ideal. And uh, I'm going to start the clock and away we go. What fintech segment for you has the biggest potential over the next five years? DeFi. What is the biggest pain point in your everyday financial life that you would like to see resolved? International payment. Are we, are we at the beginning, middle or end of the fintech wave? Middle plus. Do you have a metaverse strategy? Not at all. <laughs> Do you think regulations in the US and EU have uh, kept pace with uh, new developments in financial services? Not at all. How would you describe NFTs? A, a scam, B, an interesting concept, or C, part of the future that we uh, really don't want to miss out on? B. Have you ever invested in crypto? Yes. Are physical points of sales part of the future of finance? Yes. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most likely, how likely are the following over the next 10 years to happen? Question 1, that one of the neo banks will be as profitable as a top tier legacy bank. Likelihood out of 10. 8. CBDCs uh, become a mainstream reality. Oh. Run out of time. I'll finish that question since I started it. Uh, CBDCs uh, will become a mainstream reality in the EU and US. Uh huh. Uh, five years, you said? No, in ten years. Ten years? Yeah, seven. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that exciting note, Ben, uh, we're out of time for the rapid fire round of questions and for the interview. So uh, I just want to thank Briga founder and CEO Ben Morell for joining me today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, guys. And for everyone watching, I will be back again next week with another big name from the world of finance and technology. We do hope you'll be able to join us again then. In the meantime, don't forget to subscribe to the Paris Fintech Forum YouTube channel and to follow us on Twitter at Paris Fin Forum. That's all for now. Hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.